Before I die, I want to have the privilege of doing one thing at least one time. I'd like the privilege of starting one minute early tonight, so let's pray. (laughs) Thank you, Father, for the purpose that we've assembled together tonight. We're going to be challenged by scriptures that will make us think, if we're willing to, and will certainly humble us if we properly understand. It's not very encouraging when we think that we've been doing pretty well to read about a man like the Apostle Paul. He makes us feel so little. Not because he wants to, but because honesty tells us that here was a man that was so committed to you, at least he makes me feel ashamed. I wish I could do so much more. But you see fit to let us see something about this man and the kind of concern he had for others. It was all because of his relationship with you. And that's why we're here. We're related to you in a family way. And we want to better understand that family relationship. And we want you to make us the kind of people that you can be proud of. But we know that that's going to require some cooperation on our part. So may our study tonight challenge each one of us not to think of anybody else, just of ourselves and our personal relationship with you. And may this study draw us closer to you so that what we say about you will not be just words, but they'll be something that comes from the very depths of our hearts. So lead us in that direction, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Verse 7 of chapter 3 is where we're continuing tonight. Paul writes, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Now what kind of language does Paul employ in this verse to show how his life completely changed when he surrendered to Christ? Well, he uses the language of a bookkeeper. That's why I've indicated up here. Paul is viewing his life tonight as having two columns, a credit column, and a debit column. And he's going to compare the debit column with a credit column. And that will challenge us to do the same thing. To find out where are we? And uh, where are changes needing to be made? Now, number two, was Paul's decision to renounce Judaism a snap decision? Don't believe that it was. The reason I say that is because he was on his way to uh, Damascus to further persecute the church. You read about this, first of all, in the ninth chapter of Acts. Didn't quite make it. Got close, I think. And he was blinded by a bright light. And uh, he had others with him, and they saw the light. They were not blinded in the same way that Paul was. Paul was blinded physically, but spiritually, he was able to see something or someone he'd never seen before. And what he saw changed his life completely. So what's he going to do? He doesn't know what to do. So his initial reaction in seeing this person he's never seen before is, okay, what am I supposed to do? And the person he sees tells him, well, you go on into the city. And I'm going to send you someone, and he'll tell you what to do. So he went on into the city. He had to be led by the others with him. They went to the street called Straight, to the home of a man named Judas, and he's waiting for the preacher, a man by the name of Ananias, to arrive and tell him what to do. But while he was waiting, he was fasting, he was blind, and he was wondering, what does all of this mean? So it's nothing that's going to happen just like that. It's something that's going to happen as he's trying to process how abruptly his plans have been changed. He has no idea what's in store for him. 
Now, he realizes who he's seen because he asked for his identity. And having seen the Lord, even though he saw the Lord, he's not yet a Christian. And the reason that Paul was called by the Lord was to be an apostle. But he can't be an apostle until, first of all, he becomes a Christian. Now, long before he ever became a Christian, the Lord looked at this man and saw, man, there's potential. There's a man that has great courage. There's a man that uh, has outstanding intellect. There's a man that, uh, if I can just redirect his life, will be a tremendous force for righteousness. Amen. This wasn't a snap decision. And even at this point in his life where he has already experienced three missionary journeys, and he's now probably in year number four, maybe toward the end of year number four, of being in prison. And this is not his last imprisonment, and it's not his first one. But here he's been nearly four years in prison in Rome, and uh, he's writing this letter, and so he's uh, saying some things about himself that he wants others to understand to help them have the same kind of experience he's had, which was literally a life-changing experience. I want to follow through his thinking process here. Number four, did I take number three? No. Let me take number three. You know, I, I, I really think that one of these days I'm going to get some new glasses model and see what I've got written down up here. <laughs> All right. What might Paul mean by the phrase, whatever things were gained to me? I think what he meant by this is, uh, you know, I had a pretty decent name. I was pretty popular. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I had a lot of people agree with me. I had a good relationship with the political leaders of that day. Uh, and all of a sudden, he's having to give all this up. Everything that he thought was really important was really going for him. Had a high opinion of himself. A lot of people respected him because of his tremendous ability. But he's now saying, whatever things were gained to me, there's going to be a change take place here. Number four, does Paul see his conversion as a time of going from good to better or a time from going from loss to gain? Which? Loss to gain. Loss to gain, very obviously. Why Paul abandoned uh, why did Paul abandon his former life to become a Christian? That's the only way he could become a Christian. The way he was living. And remember, he really believed he was serving God. In fact, he was doing a better job of serving God than anybody else, in his opinion. And he has to get rid of that entirely, or he'll never even know who God is. And so the only way to God for him is to give up the past, wipe out the debit column, and accept the credit that God wants to put in that column of his life. Did you get that? God wants to put what's in this column. He put what was in this column. That's all he had to go on. And this picture is much of our world today. Most of the world are living in the debit column. They're depending entirely upon themselves. The only way any of us are going to be saved is for us to allow God to credit something to our account. Now what I mean by that is there's not a person among us that is good enough to be saved, nor will we ever be able to be good enough to be saved. We're only going to be saved by receiving a gift. It's a gift of salvation. And there are several things involved in the gift of salvation. We have to be very careful about this. It's so easy to take one verse of the Bible and jump immediately to conclusion without considering all the other verses. Do you know what you have to do to be saved? Don't just depend upon one verse. There are a bunch of verses. Because there are a bunch of times in the New Testament where people are asking the question, what must I do to be saved? The initial time was on the day of Pentecost. They were convicted of their sins. And having been convicted, they realized, we need help. And so they said, what shall we do? What Peter tell them? Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Didn't say a word about faith. Not a word. Does that seem strange to you? 
Well, obviously, we have to have faith. Well, how do I know that? Well, I turn to another passage of Scripture, and he'll say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. Okay, there I have it. But is that all that's said on the subject? No, it isn't. So you have to examine Scripture after Scripture and find out every time the subject is brought up, how is it being answered? Now, each time it is answered, it's answered correctly, but it's being answered according to where the person is when they ask the question. The old illustration that you've heard many times says it so well. He left New York City, traveled to L.A. After he'd traveled a while, he stopped and said, how far is it to L.A.? He said, well, it's about 3,000 miles. Traveled another couple days, stopped and asked again, how far is it to L.A.? Well, it's about 2,000 miles. Traveled another couple days and stopped and asked, how far is it to L.A.? Well, it's about 1,000 miles. Who told him the truth? Every one of them. Their answers were all different, but they were all correct. And sometimes we assume that one answer fits all. No, it doesn't. It's only when you put them together and recognize them in their proper setting that you get the full understanding of the truth. Now, Paul is reaching that point then where he's recognizing that he's going to have to surrender the past, get out of the debit column, and the only way he's going to get in the credit column is because somebody else is going to say, they're going to put that rubber stamp, paid in full. That's what it's going to do. He's not been able to do anything. But he has to accept what has been acknowledged here. And he can't accept that until he recognizes, hey, this is just rubbish. This is garbage. This means absolutely nothing. Unfortunately, that's where most people live. And I have trouble getting out of the debit column. It's so easy to say, well, man, I don't get drunk. I don't gamble. I don't steal. I don't live an immoral life. Well, la di da. <laughs> so what? It means absolutely nothing. Amen. Nothing. That's not going to save me. There are a lot of things I don't do, and I'm glad that I don't. But am I able to do what I really need to do? No, I'm not. Can I put myself in a position? So I can enjoy living the way I'd like to know that I am. Yeah. But it's not going to be what I do. It's going to be what he does for me. That's in the credit column. Keep that in mind as we continue on here. You read verse 8, please. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the suppressing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Thank you. Now what removed the sting of a loss. Gaining Christ. That's right. The surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as his Lord. Now, what did Paul lose when he became a Christian? He lost his job. He lost his reputation. He lost his safety. He lost his former friends. And ultimately, he lost his life. Wow. That's quite a price. But that's what happened. Now, what does Paul mean by knowing Christ Jesus? This question, probably more than any question I'll ask tonight, is the one that I feel least adequate to answer. Obviously, this does not mean knowing that there is a person named Jesus. This is the kind of knowledge that will let you understand the person that you know completely. So how well do you know Jesus? And it's through Jesus we know God. How well do we know God? Yeah, we know there's a God. <coughs> but I mean, even among all of us here tonight, if the question were asked each one of us about proper or improper belief or behavior and so on and so on, do you think we're all going to agree? Probably not. How many of us would agree with what, how Jesus would have answered the question? Well, I may think that I'm agreed, and you may say, oh, he wouldn't have agreed with that. Okay, how do I make this distinction? Do you know him better than I do? Maybe. Probably. 
Maybe not. How well do we really know him? Now, Paul really got to know who Jesus was. And it's a fact that he realized who he was and how important knowing him was in order that he might really know God, who he thought he knew pretty well, and he thought he was obeying, and found out, I'm not doing anything right. I'm way behind the times. I've misunderstood everything. And he's asked to process this. Now, this is going to take about three years when he's in Arabia as he tries to undo what he thought was right and replace it with what God is telling him is right. So what is involved in knowing Christ? There are some things that you're not going to learn by reading books or by talking to people. There are some things you're going to learn by your own experience. There are some things you're going to learn by simply allowing God's Word to challenge your thinking and disturb you to the point where you recognize, man, I hadn't seen anything wrong with this, and now I don't feel so comfortable. I'm not really that confident that I've been right. I thought I was, but I'm really not that sure. So it all gets down to the point, how well do we know Christ? I, uh, I can think of several illustrations, but I don't want to get way late too much. But... Uh, It's just hard to say how well you know somebody until somebody else begins to ask you questions. In other words, somebody might say, uh, how well do you know your wife? I think probably I know her as well as anybody here tonight. But I dare say that you could ask me a question about her that I couldn't answer. But she could. You understand what I'm saying? So this business of knowing, you know, what does the scripture say? A little knowledge puffs up. You have to be very careful about that. And sometimes we think that we know more than we really do know. But here we're talking about not facts. We're knowing what hurts his heart. What offends him. What disturbs him. What pleases him. What thrills him. What really is praise to him. My brother was an editor for a Christian journal for a number of years. And he wrote an article about his wife, and he titled the article, Praise Peggy. And uh, in the article, he went around, he continued to write about this and said, I want to tell you that I really like my wife. And so the first thing I say in the morning to my wife is, Praise Peggy. And said so the breakfast table before we have our first prayer, I say, Praise Peggy. After we've eaten breakfast, I say, Praise Peggy. He said, before I go off to work, I say, praise Peggy. When I go home for dinner, I say, praise Peggy. He said, I, I try to say at least 25 or 30 times a day. I don't want to make light of this. And maybe you've not met these people, but I have. That are all the time going around saying, praise the Lord. I think, wait a minute. Is that how you praise the Lord? Do I praise Carolyn by saying, praise Carolyn? <laughs> I think she'd say, hey, stop right now. <laughs> How well do you know people? What really honors them? What really praises them? Have you ever thought you were doing something to really show appreciation for somebody and it was the very opposite thing that they wanted? How many times we offend somebody and we don't do it on purpose was because we haven't really to know them. How well do we know God? That's a thought that's being expressed here. Number four, what parable of Jesus would illustrate the truth of this verse? I think the parable of the great pri uh, pearl of great price. Remember, here's a man that was seeking the best pearl that there ever is. And when he finally found it, how much was he willing to give for it? Everything. Everything. And it's only that when we reach that point, where he is everything in our life that we're going to really know him. Now that's why I put this on the board. People live in one of these four categories. Not Christ, but I. A lot of people just don't have room for Christ at all in their lives. They do for themselves. Others will include Christ, but he comes second place. 
what I want comes first, but he'll come second. Then there are some more. There, I think there are a lot of people in this category. Oh, Christ is first in my life, but I'm still battling with I. I still have those moments that selfishness creeps in. I'm not happy about it, but it's just a fact. Now, I think that when we get to the point where we say, not I, but Christ, that we begin to understand what Paul's talking about here. Do you really know him? And this is why Bible studies like the men had last evening, like we're having tonight, and like we have on the Lord's Day, and you have at other times during the week, and your own personal devotions, all that is so very important. Okay, number five, what does it mean to count them but rubbish? It means that uh, what, all that you think is so important to you is like uh, a garbage dump. It stinks. It's repulsive. And Paul sees this about the kind of life he's lived. I think that Paul might have said, I can't believe I once lived that way. I thought it was so right and I was so wrong. Mm. And how can there be such a dramatic change? Listen, folks, that dramatic change comes only when you reach number four. When you find out it's all about Christ. And he's the example. He's my Lord. He's the one that tells me what's right or what's wrong. Number six, does that I may gain Christ suggest a continuous action? Yes, yes, yes. it does. Yes, it does. That's why you're here tonight. You all know Christ. But hopefully you'll leave here knowing him a little bit better than you did when you came. Verse 9, please. And may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Thank you. What does it mean to be found in him? One of the things that Paul emphasizes in many of his letters is the importance of our union with Christ. If we are found in him, that means we are a part of his body. Now what does it mean to be a part of his body? My hands respond to what my head tells them to do. My feet respond to what my head tells me to do. That is when your body's operating like it should, when it's a healthy body. Now if people do not have that kind of response, then obviously they have a disease, they have an illness that it, people are concerned about and trying to help them the best they can. But uh, to be in Christ is to live with a conscious awareness of what his will for our lives really is. Many years ago, the book In His Steps was written by Charles Sheldon and was a bestseller. And it's a book, a story about a community where everybody in this community decided they're going to not do anything from this point on without asking the question, what would Jesus do? And it brought a dramatic change to the whole community. Before they said anything, before they did anything, before any action was taken, what would Jesus do? Now, the theme of this verse is righteousness, and we need to talk about that. Number three, what is a righteousness of my own? That's a righteousness that's in the debit column. That's a righteousness to say that says, I go to church every Sunday. I give at least the tithe and oftentimes much more than the tithe. And I use my talents to glorify God. And I stay out of the tavern and uh, I leave a decent life and I show up to work on time and I put in an honest day's work. That's the debit column. That's self-righteousness. That's uh, the, what he's talking about that comes from the law. That's what they had in the Old Testament. And that's what Paul was living under. He knew the Old Testament well. And he measured up well to the law of the Old Testament. But this is always self-righteousness. It's what we think of ourselves because of what we have done unrelated to what Christ has done for us or what God has done for us through Christ. Now look at question number four. What is the righteousness that comes from God? This righteousness is not imparted. It is imputed. I want to make sure you understand that. Imputed. This means what I said a while ago. Paid in full. 
Does, does that have two L's on it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> another L. I didn't look quite right, but I, <coughs> I'm embarrassing to make a mistake in football. Yeah. Paid in full. Now, this means that something happened here that I could never make happen. But there's somebody who thinks a lot of me that wanted to make it happen. And he said, I can only make it happen if you'll let me. And all the verses in the Bible that speak to you how to become a Christian are telling you how to put you in a position, yourself in a position, to receive paid in full. Now, am I speaking to a group of righteous people tonight? Yes, I am. Am I bragging about you? No, I am not. I'm bragging about your God. Amen. Your God is the one who has made you who you are and what you are. He gave his son. He paid the debt. We're sinners. And we cannot save ourselves. And I cannot undo my past. Christ can. And he paid the whole thing at Calvary. Amen. And he just simply said, this is in your account. Now that's a dramatic change from what you're hearing in the world today. I know God's going to save me because I've lived a pretty decent life. Uh, you don't know that at all. And this is so sad. And we've not been able to get the message out for whatever reason. But this is why I want to make sure that we understand what is being said here. Now, question number uh, five is, what is faith? We talk a lot about faith. Faith is uh, trusting in God, really. But in order to trust in God... You've got to totally surrender yourself to him. In other words, God, I, I believe in you, but I'm going to help you along. God says, no thanks. I don't need your help. I just want you to believe that I'm going to do for you what I promised I'm going to do for you. So we have some excellent examples of what faith is in the scriptures. Elijah on top of Mount Carmel. 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah, 850 opponents. Here he's by himself. They have the vast majority on their side. They're sure they're going to win the contest. They work in vain. It never happens. With confidence, with trust in God, Elijah said, God, send down fire. Consume this sacrifice. Let these people realize Baal is not God. Did that take faith? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it did. Did Elijah do it? No, it looked like he was working against God. Because before he ever prayed that prayer, he had a ditch dug around the altar and had it filled with water and had the sacrifice soaked with water. Huh. He wanted to make sure, hey, this is no magic. I'm not a magician. I want you to know my God. My God always comes through. That's a dangerous thing I just said. Because some people are going to go away thinking... Okay, if I ask God, it's going to happen. Maybe it won't. Because too often, we don't know what is best. We don't know what to ask Him for. God will always answer your prayer according to what is best for you and others. And sometimes we don't process that. And we assume, well, it didn't work out the way I hoped it would, therefore God didn't answer my prayer. Maybe He did. Or maybe the timing wasn't right. How, how strong is our faith? And upon what do we base our faith? Folks, there's only one valid basis for your faith and mine. That's God's word. That's God's word. He keeps his promises. From Genesis 1-1 to the last verse in the 22nd chapter of Revelation, you have illustration after illustration, fact after fact, in all of history of the unfolding of his plan. And God is never embarrassed. And he never loses control even in that which he permits to happen. And God does permit a lot of bad things to happen. Classic example, death of his son on the cross. What a dramatic moment in history. When his own son, who had never done anything wrong, cried out, God, why have you forsaken me? How well do we really know God? 
That's what Paul wants them to know. Are you really getting acquainted with him? Do you really know him? Do you really understand him? Do, are, do you really trust in him? Now, I'm convinced that what Paul is saying here is if we trusted him, that is, if we had faith in him, if we had confidence in him, like we should have, we'd not bat an eye to do anything he tells us to do. And yet, probably every one of us here tonight can think of those things. If we, if we wanted to, we don't want to. But if we did, we can think of those things in our lives where deep down inside we know God's not really very happy with this. And I've been using some pretty flimsy excuses to justify my failure to measure up. I think Paul is writing to the Philippians of people that he really loves, and he's saying, but get this message. You can be better than you are. And I want you to be better, not because that's going to put you in the credit column, but it's going to glorify the one who put the paid in full there. Now, how can we possibly give God enough to say thank you for what he's done for us through Christ? Well, the bottom line is we can't. We have to just simply recognize, as Paul recognizes all, through all these letters, it's only by God's mercy, only by God's grace. It's only by God's great love that I am what I am. Number 10, please, verse 10. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death. Now, what is involved in knowing Christ according to this verse? That's right. To realize the significance of what happened on the first day of the week following his crucifixion at Calvary. Now, when you understand that power, then you're going to begin to know who he really is. To know his power and also the fellowship of his sufferings. To understand, why did he suffer? Why did he allow this to happen? Folks, that's love. That's commitment. Number two, what is the power of his resurrection? Well, yeah. It's the power that you and I have when we become Christians. It's the power of the indwelling presence of his Holy Spirit. And that power in us is the power that destroys our sins. It's that power that enables us to get out of the debit column into the credit column. And the sword that the Holy Spirit has is his word, and he uses that word to direct us, to guide us, to inform <laughs> us, to encourage us, to warn us in any way. This is why in chapter 4, verse 13 of this same letter, he's going to say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Don't you wish we could really believe that more than we do? We worry so unnecessarily. I'm not talking about being foolhardy. And that's what makes this lesson so difficult for me to teach. Because it's so easy to react to everything I'm saying and jump to a, a very opposite conclusion of what I think Paul's really saying. Why? We can do all things. What are all things? Well, all things that God wants us to do. Not all things I want to do. But I can certainly do what he asked me to do. You know, if, if I could just know him that well, then I realize I never have any grounds to say, God, I'm sorry. See, if I'd really trusted him, he would have enabled me. But you know, people point out and say, hey, you can be better than you are. You're exactly right. I sure can. And I hope I will be. But I, like all of the rest of us, I'm a work in progress. And we have to keep our eyes focused upon Christ, depend upon his strength, because he will enable us to be the people that he wants us to be. Wow. I'm not preaching to you folks. I'm preaching to myself. I just want you to understand that. Number three, why does Paul mention the power of his resurrection before speaking of his sufferings? Ephesus, everything pales in comparison. You're exactly right. And it's the power of his resurrection that makes us willing, even more than willing, to suffer for him, knowing that anything that is done for him and his glory is never in vain. 
It's always going to be a blessing in the end. We may not see it in the time, but it's always going to be that way. Just look, Paul, has anyone as a Christian ever suffered like Paul did? And think how many countless thousands of people throughout history have been blessed just simply by reading about his life. And that's why I began tonight by saying, you know, Paul, wow, what a man. What a man of God. And we think we're doing well. We've got so much to do. I don't want us to feel sorry for ourselves, folks. I just want us to be challenged by the power of his word and the power of good illustrations that he uses and those who really have, who really get it, who really know him and are willing to suffer knowing that the suffering for the Lord is never in vain. What is the fellowship of his suffering? I think it's when you can realize, okay, boy, this has been a tough experience for me. But God's going to be happy. Because the reason I was willing to put up with this ridicule at work is because I really love my Lord. And I'm offended when people take his name in vain. And they could see it on my face. And I would not laugh at their dirty jokes. But I go home that night and I sleep well. Because I know that it was by the power of his resurrection that gave me the strength to withstand ridicule, persecution, suffering, as it may be. What's the meaning of being conformed to his death? By the way, being conformed to his death is something that is something that's going on all the time. And so what he's saying is, uh, we need to, how does the Bible say this? If you're going to be my disciple, you have to take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Is there going to be suffering along the way? When a person took up the cross on that day, he is carrying the instrument of execution to the place where he's going to kill, be killed. Are we willing to go that direction if that's the way God is leading us or allowing us to be led? To what degree then are we conforming to his death? I think that he's simply saying, listen, there is no excuse in our lives at any moment, at any time, for us to be anything less than Christian. Now, sometimes you're really put on the spot. I know that. I've been put on the spot several times. When you feel like, uh-oh, man, I've offended that person, but I just can't, I can't laugh at that. I can't agree with that, not as a Christian. Hmm. And yet, the strength that you get at that time is a strength that the Holy Spirit will provide for you if you simply let him work in your life through his word. This is going to come out really more clearly as we go on even in the next chapter. Verse 11, well, I didn't take number 6, did I? Is there any thought of Paul's suffering for Christ's sake in this verse? I think so. Verse 11, please. In order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Yeah. Does, does Paul look forward to a resurrection? Yes. Yes, he does. He's experiencing the suffering now. There's a hymn we used to sing. The way of the cross leads home. And that's true. We suffer. But suffering is not the end of the story. Victory. With Christ, total absence of all sin. Paul is looking forward to his new body. It's going to happen at the time of the resurrection, which is going to happen to all people. This is what he describes for us in great detail in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. You ought to write down 1 Corinthians 15 as an amplification of your answer to question number one. Number two, do the words, in order that I may attain, suggest any doubt in Paul's mind concerning his, the final resurrection. Oh, I don't think so at all. But Paul knows that he has to depend upon Christ. Do you remember in the second letter that's written to seven, there are seven letters written to seven churches <coughs> recorded for us in Revelation 2 and 3. The second letter was addressed to the church of Smyrna in verse 10 of chapter 2. Remain faithful until death. In other words, as long as you live and breathe, make sure you remain faithful to the Lord. That's our responsibility. And I think that's what he's indicating here. I, uh, I'm doing well. He knows that. I can do better. He knows that. He's trying to do better. And he is. And other people recognize that. But could something happen along the line that would make all this waste? He doesn't want that to happen. 
doesn't even want to think about that. But he says, I'm going to remain faithful. I'm going to live in the power of the resurrection because I want to make sure that you and I, he knows he's going to be raised, but the resurrection is going to involve the good and the bad. <coughs> That's in John chapter 5 where you read about that, verse 28. Some be resurrection unto life, some be resurrection unto death, condemnation. He wants to make sure that his resurrection, that his future is going to be spent with God. Um, so I think that what Paul is saying in this verse is an expression of his own humility. I don't think it's an expression of doubt at all. I, I just see too much of what Paul writes as expressing a, small, a strong confidence. He knows what God promises he's going to deliver. He just is being very humble in the way in which he's expressing this. Not trying to think more highly of himself than he ought. And that's, that's hard to do, but we all need to try to do that. Verse 12, please. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Yeah. In other words, Paul says, I want to I wanna keep on the path I'm going. I'm going the right direction on the right road. I don't want anything to get me off of it. He said, I'm not at the end of my road here yet. I haven't come to the end of my life. And... Uh, in other words, I think that Paul is saying what you've heard me say several times. He, Paul knows he can be better than he is. And that's true of every one of us here tonight. Every one of us can be better than we are. And we ought to strive to be better. Uh, he realizes that uh, the kind of person he ought to be is not something that's going to happen overnight. But it will happen with effort. Folks, I hope that every one of you tonight are experiencing growth in Christ. I hope that you can look back over few years and see, man, I certainly understand God's Word a lot better now than I used to. And I'm certainly looking forward to heaven more than I ever did before. And I'm certainly understanding some of the things much better than I used to. You know, I've never doubted for one moment my conversion. That happened a long, long time ago. Do I know more about what happened then today than I did then? Oh, yes, I do. But I certainly hope in another year, I'll know a lot more than what I now know. I mean, growth. You're never standing still. You're either going forward or you're going backwards. And Paul, I think, is just simply in a humble way indicating that he's striving to keep on going in the right direction. Now, in what sense has Paul not already become perfect? I don't think he's talking about being sinless here. I think he's just simply saying, yes, I know I'm a man. I know I'm growing. But I want to grow even more than I already have. I think he's using the term perfect uh, in maturity. I want, to, I want to be more mature in Christ than I am at this point. This uh, word that's translated perfect uh, is the Greek word teleos. It's a word that means that you accomplish the purpose for which you were brought into existence. You've heard me illustrate this before, some of you. In other words, I can go from point A to point B on the land in an airplane if there are no obstacles along the way. But that's not what an airplane is made for. It's made to take me off the ground and bring me down. So the airplane is not perfect when it's going down the road. It's perfect when it's going up in the air and then back down. That's what he's talking about here. I, I want, you know, I, I want to be mature. Now, can we all say we want to be more mature than we are? I think so. I think Paul is encouraging his audience in Philippi by talking this way. I think he's wanting them to uh, be more mature. Do we ever have our disagreements? Do we ever have our little problems? Yes, we do. Does maturity help take care of that? Well, I've observed from the people that are here tonight, as best I can understand you, you're doing a lot better job of behaving correctly than you did when you were two or three or four years of age. <laughs> I wasn't around then, but, uh, well, yes, I was around, but I just wasn't with you. <laughs> but I'm guessing. And, you know, how often do parents say, under their breath, of course, I wish you'd grow up. <laughs> Why are you allowing all these little petty things to be such big things? And what do they do? They do grow up. They do mature. But even adults need to mature, don't they? 
I think if we were maturing, some of us wouldn't be in our second childhood. Anyhow, <laughs> number three, what is significant about I press on? Sound like a runner in a race to me. Perseverance. Yeah, that's exactly right. He's not taking anything for granted. Paul says, I just have to press on. In other words, I'm straining. I'm putting strong effort in order to be the kind of a person that God wants me to be so that I will have done when I finish the course here upon this earth. Well, what did he say in 2 Timothy? He said, I fought the good fight. I kept the faith. I finished the course. Wow, that's, 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 that's impressive. Therefore, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, not for me alone, but for everybody who loves his appearing. Number four, what is that for which also I was laid hold of in Christ Jesus? I think that Paul is saying, I wish I could know Jesus the way he knows me. Mm -hmm. I wish I could know Jesus the way he knows me. That's what he has in mind. You know, Paul is, is growing. He is in the making. And he's sharing this with others to encourage them. Verse 13, please. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Why may we assume that what Paul is saying in the first part of this verse is important to him? Because this is the third time he said it. This is the third time he's affirmed, you know, I'm not what I ought to be. I, I need to be better. So he's concerned about this. Now, what is the lesson of, but one thing I do? Is it not true that many of us don't get much done because we try to do too many things at one time? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's not that we're doing anything bad, not that we're lazy, we're just trying to do too much and we can't do all we're trying to do. So, you know, one thing I do. In other words, is there one thing that really has top priority in my life? I don't know where I ever heard this, but wherever I heard it, it stuck with me. Mm -hmm. If you want to make each day count and you want to really plan out your day well, do it. Mm -hmm. Put it down on a piece of paper and make sure you put number one, what is the most important. And then put everything else in the order of importance. And then go out and make sure you do number one before you do number two. Make sure you complete number two before you go to number three. Now if you only get down to four and there are ten items, that's all right. You've done the best you could that day. But put in the order of priority. Now, number one on our list as Christians would be, I want to please God in everything that I do. Just want to make sure what I say, where I go, who I am, I want to please God in everything I do. Number three, why is it important to forget what lies behind? It's really easy to live on your past accomplishments. And uh, that's something, the older you get, the more important this is going to be to remember. Uh, you know, you may have been doing some great things in days gone by. That's not the thing he's talking about here, he said. Forget about that. I mean, whatever you've done in the past, forget about it. By the way, that's over in this debit column. Forget about it. Just focus in on what Christ wants to do for you, what you can do for him as an expression of gratitude to him. And keep pressing on looking forward to being better than you are. Uh, this prompts me to say that in Christ there is no retirement. You may retire from your job and you may retire from anything that you're doing physically and materially. In fact, you will because your body just won't let you do what you'd like to do. But as long as you live, you will never retire from being the very best Christian that you can be. That's the important thing. And I think sometimes people think, well, I'm going to take a vacation from God. Why would you want to do that? And why would anybody say, well, I've done my term. I'm just going to stay home on Sundays now. Why would they want to say that? I don't know. So what picture is seen in the words reaching forward to what lies ahead? Yeah, I think he's using the, the language of an athlete. I think he was a sports fan. I really do. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's making forward progress, and he wants to keep on making forward progress. Read it now in verse 14. 
I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you. Who wins in the race that Paul speaks of? We do. Everyone who finishes. Let's answer it that way. I like what you say, we do. But I want to make sure we understand that we are all going to finish it. Now, what is Paul's goal? Obviously, his goal is to be like Christ. That's the goal of every one of us, to be like Christ. What is the prize? He doesn't tell us. Except that whatever it is, it's involved in being in fellowship with Christ. In other words, it's all because of what he's done for us. It's because we're in his family. We're part of the body of Christ. We share in that fellowship with one another, brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, when did Paul receive the upward call of God in Christ Jesus? On the road to Damascus. Yes, that's right. On his way to Damascus. What does it mean to be called of God in Christ Jesus? Jesus said, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man what? Nobody comes to the Father but through me. Right. So it's through Christ. You don't really know God unless you know Christ. Wow. We need to emphasize the importance of knowing Jesus. This is what makes reading the gospel records, in fact, all the New Testament, so very important. Verse 15. <laughs> Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> can, can, I, can I back up to um, question one under verse 14? Sure. You said, who wins, the, wins in this race that Paul speaks of? You said everybody who finishes. Yes. Can you explain that? Hmm. Sure. It's not a, the race that we're involved in is not for me to be better than you or you to be better than me. The race we're involved in is to reach the goal. And when we reach the goal, we're all finishers. Because we're all one in Christ. We are family. So it's not a case of where, well, my hand got there, but my left hand didn't make it. So this 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 got the victory, but this didn't. No, you're a body. And he's simply indicating that the whole body is going to finish. And we then are victors. We win the race. In other words, Christians are not in competition with each other. Okay. Now, let me add something to what I've just said. I do believe that uh, this is the purpose of the judgment that we're going to face. On the day of judgment, God is going to reward us for everything that we've done. Okay. Now, will you get more rewards than I? I don't know. And even if you do, I'll never find out. And if I get more than you, you're, you're not going to know it either. Because there's no jealousy in heaven. It's just one of the marvels of God. He's going to make sure that you get credit for everything you have credit coming for. <laughs> he really appreciates what we do. And by the way, our eternity is not based upon our works, but our rewards are based upon our works. And we will be rewarded. You cannot even give a cup of cold water without the Lord noting that. And how many things we're going to be rewarded for? We thought, well, that wasn't very important. That's why you need to read Matthew 25 again and again. Lord, when did I give somebody a drink when they were thirsty? When did I give somebody clothes when they were naked? When did I visit somebody when they were sick? And Jesus said, well, inasmuch as you did it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And I'm going to be rewarded for that. But will I know what your reward is? No. Will you know what mine is? No. It's not our business. So we're all finishers. We're all going to make it to heaven. And we'll be duly rewarded. But, you know, we don't worry about that. We just know that whatever God does is right and we'll be blessed. Does that help at all? Probably not. I don't know how to answer your question. Um, okay. I, I totally agree with what you're saying then and how you explained it. How nice! <laughs> the beginning, the beginning, uh, and I, I don't think you mean this. And um, but when you say the hand finish, you want to make sure the foot finishes. 
I take that to mean that salvation, you're putting it in a works category. Can't be in the works category. It, exactly. I know it can't. That's right. right. And I don't think, it, you, you know, I think you agree there, but that's just the way I kind of took it, that we finish the race. I mean, we finish the race by accepting Christ as our Savior and giving our life to Him. That makes us winners. Right. Right. Okay, so that's the goal. So, so you're just as much a winner as I am. Right. And vice versa. Right. So, so it's not a case of when you became who became a Christian first. Right. It's just the fact that all who become Christians are the ones that are going to be finishing, <laughs> and they're the winners. Okay. It's not a contest among okay. ourselves. So accepting Christ as our Savior, we have finished the race. Then. Is, is well, no, we haven't finished. We We've got to live well, the life out. To got to be faithful unto death, you know. Mm -hmm. So faithfulness along the way and living the Christian life. That's why Paul's writing this letter. He said, hey, okay. folks, you're a great church, and you've supported me, and I really appreciate this. But listen, you can be better than you are, and let me encourage you to be better. And by the way, how well do you know Christ? If you can know him better, I want you to know him better. So he's encouraging you to be better than they are, to know more. Now, will we ever get to the point where we know all there is to know? No, we won't. We'd be God if we did. That's not going to happen. But until the day that God calls us home or the Lord comes or whenever it is, until that day, Paul is just simply making it clear. Uh, we've got a race to run, and you need to finish this race, and you're going to be rewarded, and everyone is going to experience victory simply by finishing the race. It's not a race in which you're looking for gold, silver, or bronze. It's a race in which you're saying, I made it. So do you think you can start the race and then drop out of the race? Right. Oh, I know you can. Right. Why would God give warning for something that there was no need to have warning for? Right. So then that's part of finishing the race. Right. Sure is. Because you can give up your salvation. You sure can. Okay. You sure can. That's why, that's why all the admonitions in Scripture to be faithful and to the end and, and uh, the sixth chapter of Hebrews and the tenth chapter of Hebrews and uh, other passages, uh, what Paul, what Jesus said to the disciples in the upper room, when he said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Now, folks, you've got to be on the vine to be a branch. But he talks about those branches are cut off, and they're thrown in the fire. And they once were on that vine, but they're cut off, they're thrown in the fire. He said, I and you, you think any of these apostles were cut off? I think so. Judas, that's pretty clear. Was he an apostle? The Bible says so. Did Jesus call him? The Bible says so. Did he respond to the call of God? The Bible says so. Did he make a bad decision in his life? He sure did. Okay, now I explain. Now I understand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Was it? Thank you for asking. Oh. <laughs> yeah, he's wanted to know that for weeks now. I've been mean, really blessed him I'm by having the courage to ask me what he's afraid of. <laughs> he's scared to death of me, you know, so he asked me. <laughs> now, does anybody want to tell me where I am? <laughs> Verse 15. Verse 15? All right. Let Let's read it then. Let us, therefore, as many are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. Thank you. At this point, Paul leaves his personal narrative. What call does he extend to his readers? I think he wants them to be like him in really pressing on toward the goal for the prize that I call him God in Christ Jesus. I think he's really trying to stimulate them to be better than they are. Are, the, are these words addressed to his friends or his opponents? I think he's primarily talking about the people in the church. Let us. I'm including myself, but I'm including you. We are all the body of Christ. Let us, therefore, as many as are mature, have this attitude. I think that's what he's talking about here. Does the first part of this verse suggest that all his readers are perfect? No. No. I think he's hoping that those who have not really matured as much as they ought to would keep working at it so they would become a full-grown Christian. Uh, you know, we mature in a number of different ways. And I think he's simply encouraging that matur uh, maturity to uh, take place. How do we know that Paul is including himself in his exhortation? With the word us. He's making himself a part of it. 
Now, what irony do we see in this verse? That's why I put this sentence up here. You looked at that and thought I was stuttering. I'm not stuttering. <laughs> that, that, that that person used was correct. Now, I've got four words used in succession. Do all four of those words belong there? Well, yes, they do. Do they all have the same meaning? No, they don't. Can one word have more than one meaning? It does. This is pointing out this, that, that, that that man, that person, this is pointing out this person. Each one of these is saying something a little bit different, but they're all used correctly. That, that, in other words, that should be an H there. Sorry about that. That, that, in other words, the word that 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 man used, that, that, that word, that, that person, this particular person used was correct. I'm still stuttering. I know, I know. Now we get back to this same word again, perfect. The word perfect, as I indicated a while ago, can be translated sinless. And a lot of people immediately jump to that conclusion, and that's a wrong conclusion. Paul's not talking about being sinless. We just can't do that. Remember, the only reason we are righteous is not because of our righteousness. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. It's his righteousness. It's what he's paid in full for our account. That's put here. And the fact that what Christ did for us at Calvary has erased all this whole stuff. So the only thing we've got going for us is this paid in full. Now, do I want to make sure that the one who paid it in full gets my thanksgiving? Oh, yes, I do. I don't know a higher motive for wanting to live for Jesus than just to realize what he's done for me by his grace and his mercy. So, uh, in this particular uh, case, in verse 12, he uses the word, uh, he said, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect. In other words, I've not really completed my race yet. I'm still racing. I'm still going toward the line, but I'm in there running. So I think he's uh, using it uh, in verse 12. He's, I think he's saying, uh, I've not, I haven't already become perfect. In other words, I haven't, finished, I haven't come to the finish line yet. But in this verse, I think uh, he's saying, uh, as many as are perfect, that is mature. In other words, if you've reached that point, then that's great. That's great. But just using it with a, I'm just pointing out that the word can have shades of meaning different and yet it be an accurate translation. And this is one of those words that uh, is used in different ways. I think I've not explained that very well to you. I'm sorry. Um, but it's, uh, it's the degrees of uh, maturity that uh, we're talking about here. And he says, I think he's simply saying that some of you are more mature than others. And let's mutually encourage each other until we all become as mature as we really want to be. And I think in a group this size, we could say honestly that some are more mature than others. But we all want to be fully mature. What does Paul mean by a different attitude? I think he's saying that sometimes we view things differently. And, uh, you know, uh, sometimes we have the same goal in mind, but we just go about it a little bit differently. And I think we have to be careful that we are not judgmental. Let me give you an, uh, an illustration. Uh, there's a girl, a uh, girl, she's a lady now, but uh, she went into nurses' training. Now, she wanted to be a medical missionary. So she went to nurses' training. And when people learned that she wanted to be a medical missionary and went to nurses' training before going to Bible college, she said, she'll never make it. She'll go into nurses' training, she'll be so enamored with that that she won't go any further. They were wrong. She did go to Bible college. And what the people didn't realize is they thought, boy, if she doesn't go to Bible college and get well grounded, uh, she'll never go to the mission field. But she did. She served at a hospital in Rhodesia, when it was called Rhodesia in Africa. She then served in an orphanage in India, Kalpahar, India, and has spent the last years of her life down in Honduras. Been a missionary all of her life. 
Did she go about it differently than most other people did? Yeah, she did. But did she get there? Yeah, she sure did. So we have to be very careful that we don't judge others by ourselves. Amen. We have to be very careful about that. The main thing is, let's make sure that however we're going about it, whatever, whatever our priorities may be, that uppermost in our mind is we want to reach that goal that we have in Christ Jesus. Number seven, what is meant by God will reveal also to you. I think that uh, he's saying here that if anybody has some wrong thoughts or some misinformation, just keep studying the Bible. It's going to get it corrected. God will give you the true knowledge that's in his word. Sorry I went over time. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Again, I thank you for Paul, for the words you've given to us through him to challenge us, to encourage us, and perhaps most of all to help us to realize we're nothing without you. Help us to remember that every moment of every day. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you.